This episode of Body Banter contains discussion of sudden infant death syndrome as it relates to anatomy and the human body. You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagoya Dile and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Body Banter. My name is Claudia Krebs, and I'm joining you on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation, currently occupied by the University of British Columbia here in Vancouver, Canada. And with me is, of course, Shagan Oyedeli. Hi, Hello, Shagan. everyone. Hi, Claudia. I'm Shagan Oyedeli, and I'm joining you from Kelowna in the Okanagan oh. campus of UBC, which is located on the traditional and unceded territories of the Silks Okanagan nations. And we have a wonderful guest today. Um, and I'm going to allow Jeff to uh, introduce himself. He is, I'm really, really excited about <laughs> introducing him to you today. And uh, why don't you introduce yourself, uh, Professor Jeff Leitman? Thank you so much. Can I talk now? Is it okay? The floor is all yours. <laughs> Claudia Shagan, thank you so very, very much for inviting me to your wonderful and very valuable series. So hello out there. Uh, my name is Jeff Leitman. I'm a distinguished professor at the Icon School of Medicine in New York. I'm a professor and director of our Center for Anatomy and Functional Morphology, which oversees a lot of our research, as well as uh, overseeing uh are some 25 different courses in anatomy that we run uh, for medical students and for residents and for fellows. I'm also a professor of otolaryngology. Uh, my research is in areas of the head and neck and throat and a professor of medical education, because that's one of my loves. And I've been very blessed to have the ability to do this. I've just completed my 45th year at Mount Sinai. So I've had the opportunity to see my school grow and prosper. And that's been wonderful. So I'm excited to be here with two wonderful people in my field. I'm also the past president of the American Association for Anatomy. So I take parental pride in seeing the new and extraordinary work that our next generation is doing. So I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Well, Jeff, we're so honored that you could join us today. You have such an illustrious career in anatomy. You have really contributed in significant ways to the field, especially when we're talking about the anatomy of the head and neck. Maybe let's jump in right there, because sure. I know that's one of your big passions is the anatomy of the larynx and human phonation and comparative anatomy. Tell us about your journey into there and what your most exciting findings in that field are. So I'd be glad to. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I came to study anatomy and how I came to study the groups that I study, which are primates, which we're one of, and how I got to study my area of love, which is centered in the middle of your throat. So if I could take that path, I'd be glad to sort of do that because I, I can I know exactly when I decided to do what I wanted to do. I was a little boy. I grew up in Brooklyn, in New York, and we were, I guess, relatively, a family of relatively modest or poor means. We couldn't travel, we couldn't go places. That wasn't an opportunity. And mostly I traveled in my mind. I was fascinated by things, particularly what was inside things. It came a time that we were able to go with my class to the Great American Museum of Natural History in Manhattan. It was our class trip. This was phenomenal. And I fell in love with the place. It was extraordinary, particularly to see the enormity of the dinosaurs and the bones looking what was inside. And we had different students. They were all sort of different. 
sort of the aggressive kids like the tyrannosaurs and sort of the funny kids that had things we called uh, pocket protectors. You're too young to know those. We used to wear them in pocket and put pens in. They like the odd dinosaurs, like the duck build. And sort of chubby kids like me, we like brontosauruses and whatnot. Well, at the museum, one of the Tyrannosaurus kids teased me and challenged me to climb on a brontosaurus. And I didn't want to show that I couldn't. And so I went underneath the link chain and I climbed on the tail of the great brontosaurus in the Great Hall at the American Museum of Natural History. Within seconds, a massive guard came by, pulled me by the scruff of the neck, yelling and screaming at me, and ejected me from the museum, along with my entire class. This was devastating. I had no little postcards or anything to write my little report on. I was only about eight years old. And I came home, petrified that my mother would find out. Because if I was bad, I would have been sent to what we called summer school, which was the great penalty for students like me that didn't listen. Well, I was outside my house and my dad came home. He saw me looking very sad. And he said to me, what happened? I told him. He didn't flinch. He was French and always had a different take on the world. He always saw things sort of in mellifluous, beautiful tones. He wasn't my mother, which tougher. He said, be prepared. Tomorrow morning, we're going to go somewhere, and this will be another interesting trip for you. And so we rode away from my native Brooklyn to another part of New York, the Bronx, and the Bronx Zoo. And I saw numerous animals. But truthfully, I didn't like most of them. The seals were like barking dogs. The rhinoceroses looked like small cars. I was frightened of the elephants. And then all of a sudden, I saw something which brought joy to my heart. It was the monkey house. And I came and stood on the railings and I was fascinated by what I was seeing. Here were animals that were acting just like my family. And I started to name them in my mind. There was big pushy Aunt Flo who was shoving them around. There were two like my cousin Erwin and Richie that were fighting in the corner. And I tried to get a little closer. And as I got a little closer, all of a sudden a huge guard came by and yelled at me to get off the railing. And he pulled me again by the neck and I was pleading, please, mister, I just want to see the monkeys a little closer. And he yelled at me again. I can still hear it to this day. I said, get off, move away. And just as he was yelling at me, out of nowhere, the monkeys threw poop that hit him in the face. It's a moment that my heart leapt. And I could swear they were looking at me, and I thought one of them even gave me a thumbs up. I smiled from side to side. They were what we call in my parents' native language, mishbucha family. And I was enthralled by them. And as the guard scurried away using words my mother said never to use, I knew that I wanted to know more about these extraordinary animals, these extraordinary beings, which were so much like us, yet not exactly. And so I chose early on what I wanted to do. I wanted to study this magnificent group of primates or primates, if we use the scientific term of the order, of which we are one of. And I wanted to know more about them. I wanted to sort of understand the similarities and the differences. Because as I saw, there was so much like we were, but yet not exactly. 
They couldn't, for example, sit down and have a conversation with us. They couldn't speak the way you and I can speak. That was something which started to go into my mind and my thoughts even when I was a little boy. And that's something which stayed with me throughout my career. I wanted to know how these animals would communicate. And more, what was special about you and me? And that actually led me to the area that I've worked on most of my life, which is studying the anatomy of the head and neck, particularly the extraordinary nature of our throat, a region that most people don't think too much about. And that sort of targeted me to my area that I work on. If I may, I'll tell you a little bit about that area, if that's okay. Absolutely. I think this must be the most unique origin story. The poo flinging monkey inspired young Jeff Laidman to become a comparative anatomist. And then he thought they can fling poo, but they can't yell the insults. Why can't they talk? Yeah, that and was basically it. There you go. That's that's really wonderful. So tell us about the the primate neck and how our neck is different. Why can we speak? How did that all happen in evolutionary so, terms? It becomes a fascinating journey. And, you know, something I could talk on a lot, so I hope I don't put your good audience to sleep. But in the middle of our throat, we have a structure that is called in lay terms, the voice box. It's technical, technical term is the larynx. And we think about it as, well, that's where sounds come from. And that's all there is. But this is a marvelous structure. And inside this structure, there are things we call the vocal cords in lay term or vocal folds. It's a magnificent area. If this structure, the larynx and the folds, was not working correctly, you couldn't lift a heavy object. You couldn't poop if you were constipated. And you couldn't give birth to a baby. That's extraordinary. All of that is controlled by the thing that sits in the middle of your throat. Now, how does that come to be? These vocal folds evolved for purposes of letting air in and out. We're air-breathing mammals. The most important thing an air-breathing mammal has to do is breathe air. So these folds are there and they open to let air in. But the folds also evolve for protection because our airway is so special. We can't get something caught in it and so we developed a type of sphincter. That's what these folds came to be. But even beyond the closing and protecting mechanisms, they, ev they evolved to control what we call intrathoracic and intra-abdominal pressures. This is enormous, and we don't think about this. Think the next time when you're watching one of these 800-pound weightlifters lift a weight. Think what you hear. You'll hear somebody grabbing the heavy weights, and then you'll hear a sound. <laughs> that could be a hernia, but more often than not, it isn't. It's the vocal folds coming together. And what they do is they stabilize, increase intrathoracic pressure, and allow one to use the rib cage and the muscles as a strut upon which to lift the heavy weight. And then they'll stand back a little and they'll drop it and you'll hear another sound. Ah! As the vocal folds open up. Now, I want you to think for a second, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be inelegant, but I'm from Brooklyn. And think what you do when you're constipated and you're sitting on the bowl. I'll tell you what you don't do. You don't sing 
We all live in a little submarine, a submarine, a yellow submarine. You're not going to say you can sing all day, but you're not going to help nature do its duty, so to speak. What you do is you force those folds together. Those are forcing the folds together. It increases intra-abdominal pressure, and that allows you to help nature do its work. That's the same thing that a pregnant woman does when you're giving birth. You have to be able to bear down in order to help little Janie or little Johnny take the incredible trip. So this structure that sits in your neck is extraordinary. It's our pathway for air. It has protective devices. It controls intrathoracic and intra-abdominal pressures. What a super important structure involved in our basic activities. So for me, the questions began, what is special about the human larynx and its configuration? How does it get to be that way? How does it differ from those of a, a dog, a cat, a whale, or my monkey cousins that I was looking at? Are there changes through development? Were there changes through evolution? And if so, how do we look for them? Now, I've spent my life in two different boxes. One is in a medical school. That's where I am. And the issues I've asked often here, being in our Department of Otolaryngology, is how do things change from pre-birth through the early years and into our adulthood in this incredible area. There's one thing, and I'll get back to it later, unless I'm unplugged. I want you to always remember the human animal is different at different stages of our lifespan. Sometimes we make the mistake that thinking we're static. We're not. We go through such extraordinary changes. And scientifically, we're starting to learn about them. And we change so radically. So let me tell you a little bit about the larynx and its position in the throat, what that means, and why that's so crucial. By the way, you have something in your body that's called a vocal fold tester. This will show you how important the larynx is. You know, as you study your anatomy, you will find that nature gives us our most important and powerful nerves to protect prime areas. The most important nerve in the body, as a neuroanatomist and biologist, Claudia knows nerves, is going to be what we call big mama, the vagus. The vagus nerve is always found in areas of great importance. The vagus nerve shares four brainstem nuclei with its sister, the glossopharyngeal nerve. If you take your finger, I'm not suggesting you do this, but you may want to think about it, and you put that finger towards your mouth on the lips, you'll start to get some sensations. That's because the fifth cranial nerve is waking up. If you open your mouth and you put your finger inside and touch the front of your tongue, sensation-wise, you'll feel from the fifth nerve and also taste sort of lousy. That's on what we call the seventh nerve. As you start to put your finger going back a little further, you'll start to feel uncomfortable. You'll start to gag. What's happening is the ninth nerve, which is a big name, glossopharyngeal, tongue and pharynx, is picking up an invader. And you're starting to go towards the holy of holies. You're daring to go where no human should go. You're coming to the center of your breathing protection. Now, I have two sisters. 
The minute I tell one something, the other's going to know within 10 minutes. It's incredible. They talk 50 times a day. This is what happens when you stick your finger in your mouth. The ninth nerve is our nerve of our gag reflex. Everything it knows, it tells its big sib. If you go a little further in and touch the front of this larynx, which is called the epiglottis, and put your finger a little further, oh my goodness, now Big Mama is taking over. You are not allowed to invade the Holy of Holies. And what will happen to you is the vagus will speak to every muscle it knows, it will spasm immediately, and you will have a terrible upchuck all over the place. You may urinate, you may defecate, your body is going into a mini shock because you have dared to go where you're not allowed to go. And this tells us about the sacredness and the specialness of this thing that you probably never thought about but sits in the middle of our throat, the larynx, and its vocal folds. That is the most amazing journey to differentiate between gagging and retching that I've heard. I was like, on, I was like breaking into a sweat, like what's going to happen next? So I love how you put the larynx as this sort of sacred piece in our throat that protects our lungs. And, you know, as air breathing mammals, as you say, this is so important to us. It also has this function of phonation, of course, right? So we talked about the vocal folds protecting, but then we have the vocal cords, which can vibrate and cause phonation. Tell us a little bit more about that aspect. Okay. So let me get into my journey. And as you see, I talk the least about phonation because even though that is a culminating and special feature for us, nature has its own way. So for nature, you have to be able to breathe. You have to be able to swallow. You have to be able to poop. And if you have time left over, you can talk about it. So nature follows its own path. So let's take a little journey to see what's special about our larynx and what's special about what's inside it. So as I said, I've spent most of my life at my medical school and a lot we explore for clinical reasons and other for scientific. This larynx, by the way, when you look at it comparatively in most animals is fascinating. It sits what we call very high in the throat. And when you look at pictures, you'll see the front of it, this epiglottis, is like a guide that takes the larynx into the back of the nasal cavity. And so most animals have a direct air tube from the nose through the larynx and trachea to the lungs. At the same time, there are pathways that go around the larynx. So if you're a happy little dog or a little rabbit or a whale, you have an airway and a food way. They don't cross. This is called the two tube or two pathway system. In some, you could pull the larynx a bit down. In most, they just sit there. This is a remarkable thing. You and I don't have this. Our larynx, as we mature, is not sitting in the back of the nasal cavity. It sits all the way down in the throat. What does this mean? How does it get there? What is fascinating and has been a key thing of my research for many years is that when you look at newborn babies and you look at the location of their larynx in the throat, they look exactly like a little dog or a cat or a monkey. The larynx sits so high, it locks into the back of the nasal region. A little newborn baby can breathe and swallow almost if not actually simultaneously. They do it at the same time. This is what allows little Janie to be on mama's breast. She's also breathing. 
This is an extraordinary thing. We're not like that. Our larynx is all the way down in the throat. Little Cheney's is all the way up high. Developmentally, we go through an extraordinary change. And this change is more dangerous than going to the dark side of the moon. So imagine that one of the key structures of our human anatomy, our larynx, is going to totally change position as we age. And this is going to radically affect the way one breathes, the way one swallows, the diseases that occur, and what sounds we can produce. So what occurs, and exactly when it occurs, we're not sure. We know that within the early months of life, the first months, the little baby is what we call a habitual, if not obligatory, nose breathers. Babies breathe through the mo, the nose. They don't breathe through the mouth. If little Johnny or Janie is breathing through the mouth, something is probably wrong. It may be as wrong, as simple as a nose cold, or maybe it's something more severe. Mouth breathing in little ones is not the norm. And it's not even the norm for you and me. And I don't know how much you're going to go into the anatomy, but our pharyngeal coverings are not designed to bring in necessarily air. And if you run around in the cold weather in British Columbia and breathe through your mouth, oh my goodness, you are going to cause problems for your pharyngeal coat. Now, early on, something extraordinary happens. Between largely the third and maybe fifth months of life, the timing is not clear. What happens is infants start to show breathing through the mouth. They don't have to. They are nose breathers, but they start to show mouth breathing. So they will breathe through the nose and then unlock their larynx and breathe through the mouth, even if they don't have to. This has really fascinated us. What's going on? This is a type of training phase of the underlying central and peripheral nervous systems that are preparing the child for what is going to occur, occur later. By the way, what fascinates us as well as these early months of life, second to fourth, third to fifth around there, coincides with the peak incidence of a number of clinical pathologies, one in particular we've looked at for many years called sudden infant death syndrome, also called crib death or cot death, in which children will become rapidly cyanotic, die from asphyxiation. We're not sure. It is not a disease with a single focus. It is many things coming together. But what has long fascinated many of us is that it coincides with the first functional changes in the upper respiratory tract. As the child continues to grow, the larynx is going to shift its position. This is extraordinary. If you look at a child in the early years, the larynx from the tip of it, known as the epiglottis, to its bottom, a cartilage called the cricoid, corresponds to the bottom of the skull to about the third cervical vertebra. In adults, it goes from the third cervical vertebra to almost the seventh. This is extraordinary. This changes our breathing. This changes our swallowing. And another change occurs. The change that occurs is that above the larynx, for the first time, there is a huge area of space. And as a New Yorker, I can tell you the most valuable thing in the world is space. We need space. So as this larynx goes down in the throat, a large area of space becomes available. There's bad to this space, by the way. And this lower position of the larynx is what enables you to choke to death with greater facility than any other animal. So the next time you get a bolus of food stuck and you're coughing, that's because your larynx has gone down. We don't have a two-tube system anymore. 
And this is very prevalent in humans. You get problems such as gastroesophageal reflux disease, LPR. The head and neck reason for it is because there's now a big space, acid comes up, and it bathes the area. Oh, we get a lot of bad things. What do we get that's good? We get the opportunity to have some free breathing through the mouth. Talk a bit that evolutionary in a second. We also get an area above it that can take sounds modif that are produced at the vocal folds, and we can modify these sounds greater than any other living mammal. So space changes us. Essentially what we've done has taken, has taken a bugle and turned it into a trumpet. We've added tubing. And so there has been this enormous change developmentally. A little one, this is why little Johnny or Janie can't speak. They're able, not able to produce what we call the quantal vowels. And you need what we call a full vocal tract in order to do that. So you can't do that when you're two years of age. This is also why my friends, the monkeys, can't speak. Their larynx is all the way up in the throat. They're good little monkeys and good little chimps. But they don't have the resonating chambers that you and I have. So this is the nature of of what exists in the comparative anatomy of this region and this world. This is what I've studied for many years. The flip side of this, which has been a lot of fun, has been how did this come about evolutionarily? How did we become the apex, depending on how you define apex, the apex individual of our planet? Clearly, our speech abilities and our large brain have enabled us to do more than most other mammals. How did this come about? For almost 50 years, I've studied this by trying to understand how we could reconstruct what the throat region of our ancestors may have been like. And this is not easy. We don't have fossil throats, but we do have one part that has remained. The roof of what we call the upper respiratory tract, of which the larynx, pharynx, and others are part of, is the bottom of the skull. And what we've learned is that the muscles of the throat region all attach to the bottom of the skull. And we've learned that the bottom of the skull shape can give us an indication of how the larynx would sit in the neck, whether it sat high or whether it sat low. Skulls, to make a very long story short, so it doesn't put you all to sleep, skulls that are relatively flat on the bottom relate to muscles that are more horizontal with laryngeas that are up very high. This is what you find in a monkey or an ape or a newborn baby. Skulls that are very bent or flexed relate to a larynx that has gone down in the throat. We have very flexed skulls, meaning adult humans. Sometime, and this enabled me to go back, starting decades and decades ago, to examine the skulls of our fossil ancestors. Were they more like those of living monkeys and apes? thus allowing me to reconstruct their throat regions looking more like living monkeys and apes? Or did they look more like you and me, allowing me to reconstruct a throat much as we have? Or were they somewhat in between? And this has been a journey which I have found unbelievably fascinating. And I've had the opportunity to study fossils in over 30 countries, trying to understand what they look like and essentially trying to get them to speak, to give up their secrets about when things occurred. And what it sort of showed up showed us was that our earliest ancestors, what we call plio-pleistocene hominids from East and South Africa, 
probably were very much like living monkeys and apes. However, sometime about a million and a half years ago, things started to change on the plains of East Africa. Our brain was growing bigger. Our skull was starting to shift. And our larynx was starting to make the first bold changes. We don't exactly know why. Probably it related to our need to have some mouth breathing. At this time, the climate in Africa was temperate. You could attempt some mouth breathing, and that would give our ancestors an advantage uh, in running and other activities. Once the larynx was descended, then we gained new abilities, such as our abilities to make more sounds, and speech came on the scene. Wow, with all... all... This is fascinating. This is really fascinating to me. And I'm, and I, I, you know, we, I wish I could just let you just go on and on because of, uh, Sorry. or because of time. No, no, we need to kind of um, wrap things up. But I wanted to find out with all of this love for the larynx, which I'm guessing is your favorite part in anatomy. Do you have any part of the body that you're not so favorite of? Well, I, I don't really dislike any part of the human body. I think every part has an unbelievable story to it. And each can be as beautiful as it is. There are some things that I don't like, if I could add. I don't like when people abuse body parts. And what, I was going to ask what you meant by that. What do you mean by abuse? Okay, so our body has come to be for real reasons. Our body parts are important. Human culture abuses them. So on the side of your head, you have two things that are very nice. They're called the pinna or the external ears. If you touch the bottom of them, you will find earlobes. These are highly vascularized structures amongst the most sensitive areas in the body with numerous nerves carrying sensation from them. And what do numerous human populations do, including my own daughter that I had fights over? They use them to hang Christmas tree ornaments and other decorations. Well, as one who speaks for the body, the body hates this. Get off of my ears. Similarly, another majestic structure that most don't think about, our foot. Poor foot. We put some sock on it. We stick it in a shoe. We clip a nail. We don't think much about it. What do we do that's even worse? From the 15th century on, high-heeled shoes. This is body abuse. We've taken millions of years to evolve a double arch system in a human foot. That foot is majestic. Putting a high heel shoe on it is cruel, abusive behavior. So I ask people, that they have the podium for a few seconds, to think about abusing your body. I see people put little nose rings in their nose. Do they realize that the venous blood from areas of your nose drain both to the facial vein and internally via ophthalmic veins to the cavernous sinus? I've served as consultants in ENT to individuals that have had what's called cavernous sinus thrombos due to infections going inside. I know you love the little decoration, but think before you do these things. The body was not designed for target practice. And so that's my little podium. Please respect it and think about it. 
Thank you so much, uh, Jeff. What wise words, right? Like it's interesting what we do with our bodies and um, how we use our body to express our personality and our culture, which is often where these adornments, of course, come from. And um, and I think it's it's part of that human story as well, right? Like that we um, kind of take that risk to express our personality and, and uh, the- it's part of our cultures yeah. i understand it i'm not trying to criticize cultures i just speak at times for our body oh and, and i i think it, that's it, important something that i want folks to think about the last words i'll say before you pull the plug on me is i want you to remember that we are what's called a longitudinal species we are different in the perinatal period, the early years of life, when you get to be a child, a teenager, having had them, they're very strange species, they grow into adulthood, and then we start to get older, and we're starting to have new parts of our existence. Think for a little bit and discuss when you can how long was the human body actually meant to be? It's not that long. Most estimates probably have it going max to about 30 years, maybe, in the original blueprints. What does that mean for individuals like me? I'm not ready to go yet, but my body is changing. And as you age, your vision goes, your senses of smell goes. I can't hear certain sounds the way I used to. When my children were little, I used to yell at them to lower the television. Now in the rare instances when they visit me with my grandchildren, they tell me to lower the television. <laughs> we go through incredible changes. Appreciate the body and appreciate the magnificent journey that it's going to take. And with that, I'll shut up because I've gone over thank my you. time, I'm sure. No, thank you so much. I could listen to you for hours. You are a gifted storyteller. And I think you've really made the larynx and well, the larynx in particular come to life like a superhero story. This evolution of this small, often neglected part of our anatomy all of a sudden became the central part to our humanity. Thank you for, for that story, for that perspective, and for sharing your passionate enthusiasm for humans and their primate cousins. Thanks for taking time to share this with us and our listeners. And we hope to have you back because I think there's more stories that you can tell us. I'd love to. Thank you, folks. And thanks for all the good work that you're doing and to your your students who are going to go forward with sharing and teaching about anatomy. The more we understand, the more we understand about human oneness and the more we have appreciation for the sacredness of our body uh, and the sacredness of the bodies of others. So it's a special path that you're all on. And I thank you very much for doing it from the bottom of my heart and for having the opportunity to, to see you folks again and to speak to your class. Thank Thanks you so much, much, Jeff. I literally got goosebumps there with your final words. Thank you so much. And that concludes another episode of Body Banter. We hope to share the airways with you for our next episode. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shevon. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time. Mm -hmm.